My name's Adam Woldavsky. I'm a software engineer here. And uh, I'd like to thank Joe Little in the back for uh, bringing uh, Mary and Tom Poppendick to town. And I'm not going to tell you much about them. You're all here because uh, you know who they are and you wanted to hear them. So without further ado. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. So, um, so I'll uh, uh, thank Adam for uh, for choosing the topic for tonight. So I didn't actually choose it. I gave him a list of several things, and I, if you don't like it, I can change it. I got my computer here. And <laughs> you want me to talk about something else or ask questions about something? That's quite all right, because this one happens to be about leadership. Actually, I said a history of leadership, but. After a late dinner last night, um, I went back to the hotel room and started to gather together the talks that I've done before. And I really realized this was the first time I, or second time I did this talk, it was already videotaped and on the web. So maybe I better say something more or different than that. So uh, I renamed it a history of leadership and changed a bunch of stuff. And uh, we'll see how it goes. But I would like really to encourage you to ask questions. And you know, if you don't like it, challenge me or whatever you want. And then we'll just tool on from there. A uh, little bit about my background. I, I uh, started out life as a programmer, back when programmers were called programmers instead of developers. And programmers did like all sorts of things, like understand customers and test their software and you know, work with engineer, electrical engineers. And I did process control systems. First, I did uh, controls of uh, physics experiments at the University of Wisconsin. And then I, I did process control systems for 3M. And then I became a manager uh, at a manufacturing plant where we found ourselves in serious competition with uh, Japan and decided we had to do something entirely different we've been doing before. And we did something that in the early 1980s was called Just In Time, which came to be called Lean. And we did uh, change our plant around quite a bit, a little bit more about that later on in the talk. And um, later on, I went back to corporate headquarters and I did a bunch of product development. So uh, I was an IT manager, I was a developer, and I got into product development. I did lighting systems with ultra pure plastic, honest. And um, eventually, in the late 90s, uh, 3M had this really cool buyout offer that I couldn't refuse. So I went off and um, found myself managing a software project again as a program manager. It was a government project, and it's the very first time I ever heard this thing called waterfall. We didn't do that, honest. Uh, you know, I learned how to do software projects as an engineer in a, in a department where they didn't do computers. Computers were new, but they could put control systems on processes in their sleep. So I learned about projects from engineers who knew how to put plants together and always hit deadlines. And, that was kind of interesting. So then uh, um, I, we, I spent at 3M perhaps a dozen years or more being a manager. And I kind of liked the role of manager. And I uh, got involved in talking about how you can apply lean ideas to software. And I found some people that were in software thinking like really bad things about managers, maybe with good reason. But you didn't like the fact that there was a stereotype that all managers are bad and should disappear. And so I occasionally talk about leadership and what leadership is all about and what can do when it's done right. So that's what I'd like to talk about today, although it's not going to always be about what leadership is done right, because we're going to start back in 1850, because it's a history. I like history. And on October 5th, 1841, was the first serious train wreck in the US. Honest. At least that's what I understand from reading the history. And um, the interesting thing was that up until this time, there weren't any really big organizations outside of you know, church and military uh, and some government stuff. But big companies were just starting to exist because transportation was just becoming available, and you could just start um, amalgamating a bunch of things and creating big companies. And uh, trains used to like go from here to here on a track, and then another train a few days later from here to here on the track. 
And all of a sudden, they started putting a lot of trains on the same track. And one fine day, a couple of them ran into each other. And then they said, oh, who caused that? So there was a big question about how do you run a large dispersed train or railroad organization in such a way that trains don't crash because you can't have lots of people sending people down the same track. The answer after a you know, government investigation and all that sort of stuff was, guess what? You've seen this hierarchy before. It was an organizational structure that kind of looks just like the you know, pyramid that we all come to wonder about. And, um, and uh, the investigation came up with six principles of administration. This is sort of the first, this is what management is all about, or this is what uh, managers are supposed to do. First one was there was supposed to be proper division of responsibilities so that people had uh, you know, control over who decided who, what trains went where. There needed to be sufficient power conferred to enable the, the, the people with the responsibilities to carry them out. There had to be a means of knowing whether such responsibilities were <coughs> faithfully carried out. There had to be great promptness in reporting all derelictions of duty. Got it? And information obtained through a system of daily reports and checks. And adoption of a system to enable the general superintendent to detect errors and immediately point out the delinquent person. So it was all about assigning blame if something went wrong. Because that's what they we're trying to do is, if the trains crash, somebody has to be responsible and take the blame. This is from um, a very interesting book called The Leader's Handbook by Peter Schultes. And if you want to read more interesting stuff about leadership, this is, I think this is the book. And um, he's actually quoting The Visible Hand, The Management Revolution in American Business by Chandler in 1977. And in that book, Chandler says, basically everything there was to know about management was invented by about 1912 or 1915. I think stuff has been learned since then, but that's what he said in 1977. And um, so the beginning of management in big organizations is all about hierarchy and assigning blame. Now there were other big organizations, as I said, they were basically military organizations. And there, you know, doing the right thing is a matter of life and death and other things. So um, let's talk about what happened in 1880s. About this time, guns became more prevalent in war. And it turns out that a general could no longer stand on the top of a hill and orchestrate a battle because distances were further and guns were, you know, it enabled, you know, things got just way more confusing than they used to be. And so, um, Suzanne, you're going to have to help me. Helmut von Molke, yes? Did I get that right? Yeah. She's from Munich, so, you know, she can get me right here. Uh, as the chief of general staff in the Prussian army from 1857 to 1888 for 30 years. And he, in, in, he instituted this concept of command intent. He said, you know, in a war when a general can't stand in front and tell everybody what to do, we have to do something different. No plan of operations extends with any degree of certainty beyond the first encounter with the main enemy force. Where have you heard that before? Lots of people are quoted, but that's where it started, from Mulkey. And uh, so he had this thing called, now, what's that? Elf? Auftrag Statistik. <laughs> Got it. Auftrag Statistik. OK, or close, anyway. Which is mission tactics. And it's all about delegation of decision-making authority to subordinate commanders with the con within the context of the higher command's intent. So instead of telling people what to do, you tell the next level of command what you want done and let them figure out how to make it happen. And so that's command intent. And he said the heart of mission command is this. The advantage with a, which a commander thinks he can attain through continued personal intervention is largely illusionary. By, engage, by engaging it, in it, he assumes a task that really belongs to others, whose effectiveness he thus destroys. He also multiplies his own tasks to a point where he can no longer fulfill the whole of them. So the idea of delegation down uh, started with people who had to win wars where the rules of engagement had changed. And um, 
one of the interesting things you'll see is that a lot of the good ideas about leadership actually have come from this origin of various military engagements where things got to be a matter of life and death. Where, you know, this is the way we always did it doesn't actually hold anymore. Uh, now let's go to 1910. And it's, uh, it's a, you know, the Model T has just been invented and is about, in 1913 was the first assembly line, uh, automated assembly line. And in 1911, Frederick Winslow Trailer wrote the book, The Principles of Scientific Management. This is not the same as the scientific method, okay? It's totally different, in fact, 180 degrees, the opposite. But he had this idea, and you got a picture it's the US, it's the automotive industry or the steel industry. Most of the people that are working there have come from some other country, can't speak English, so certain people think they must be not very smart because they can't speak English, and uh, they have to be told what to do. So there's a lot of, in Frederick Winslow Taylor's writing, um, sort of condescension to people who actually do work. They're not smart, they have to be told what to do, they're lazy, they will not do the job unless you make sure and keep track of every last thing that they do. So the, the underlying theme here and the underlying assumption is that workers will do as little as possible, that workers do not care about quality, so if they aren't forced to have quality it won't happen, and that workers are not smart enough to know the best way to do their job. So you need the smart people, the engineers, to tell the workers exactly how to do their job. And there's a lot of that in the things that he did. And this hit a lot of the assembly type manufacturing environments, like automotive. And also that was widely done in the steel industry. Um, his view of efficiency was that efficiency comes from knowing exactly what you want men to do and then seeing to it that they do it in the best and cheapest way. So they don't know how to do it best and cheapest, but you know the smart people, the managers, the engineers, they do. Experts define the best way, and the way they do it is by breaking down the job into individual parts and finding the best way to do each part, and then paying the workers extra if they do it the best way that has been determined. Um, uh, the, the highly insulting flavor to this is, is really there. I mean, that's, it comes through in many of his writings. Actually, I just reread this book about a year ago, and I was kind of appalled. And it's true that it was written in another age, but it has the flavor of there are only certain smart people and everybody else is lazy and needs to be told what to do. And if you watch management in many of the Western societies, that theme has made it into a bunch of places, but not all places. For example, um, I worked at 3M, and I never actually noticed this kind of philosophy. And I'm pretty sure the reason is because 3M processes were big roll goods, you know, make big rolls of sandpaper or tape or something like that. And the people who operated the production equipment had to be extremely skilled workers. In fact, the first R&D um, uh, head in 3M, the first person headed up R&D, got fired because he couldn't get along with the production workers. And the production workers knew everything there was to know about how to make tape. And if the R&D guy didn't want to listen to him, they needed somebody else in charge of R&D. Uh, interestingly enough, you'll find in um, Toyota a very similar. It's the way that things are manufactured and the skill in manufacturing. This is the primary focus, and things spin out from there. Um, so that's the one best way. Somebody figures it out. Somebody knows what's the one best way and tells everybody what to do. And you see a lot of that in some industries. But now let's go to 1920s, and this isn't very long after that. And we'll talk about Charles Allen. He was the guy in New Bedford, Massachusetts, who started up the whole concept of industrial training. If you look into the Votech schools in the United States, you'll find that most of them had their origins in Massachusetts with three fellows, one of whom was Charles Allen. And his idea of on-the-job training was that there are people who really know how to do a job, and the way to get people to learn how to do the job is have a master train the new people coming onto the job. Um, he said second class trainers produce second class learners. So you really need experts who know how to do the job to do training. Uh, but one thing that experts may not know how to do is how to train people. So he focused it on how do we train experts to train people? Because they know how to do the job, but they don't know how to train. So he had a four-step method. Now, 
This is the days of divide every job into a lot of little bits. And there's nothing totally wrong with that. But it wasn't have experts figure it out. It says have that master craftsman divide the job into four steps. Preparation, presentation, application, and testing. And then train people how to do it. Now we have a war. There's a lot of war that triggers stuff in my story. And this particular war was a war of attrition at sea. Whoever had the most ships at the end was the winner, basically. And so there needed to be a lot of ships built in Massachusetts. And so Charles Allen was asked to put together a training program for shipbuilders. And he put together a training program for shipbuilders by training supervisors how to train people how to build ships. And in two years, 88,000 shipbuilders were trained with 100 supervisors learned how to do training. And at the end of the war, in fact, there were more ships on, in the US than other sides. So I guess it worked in any case. <laughs> in any case, he wrote this book. It's called The Instructor, The Man, and the Job, a handbook for instructions of individual, of industrial and votech subjects. And he wrote the um, uh, whole concept of training people with on-the-job training. It was very different than the uh, scientific management of the, you know, the automotive industries. And think about it, a ship is a little bit different than a car. Ships are all sort of one of, much more so than a car is. And so you needed skilled workers that could bring their skills to other areas. And um, now it's the 1930s, we're going back to Germany. And um, we have a concept of, got that? <laughs> Turpenferg, Turpenferg, okay, which is unit command. And this is the um, German field manual from 1933, 1934. And there's some interesting things in here. You can see the history from von Moltke. Um, it says uh, in section four, lessons in the art of war cannot be exhaustively compiled in the form of regulations. The principles must be applied in accordance with the situation. Good idea. Um, simple actions logically carried out will lead to the most surely to the objective. The command of an army and its subordinate units requires leaders <coughs> capable of judgment with clear vision and foresight and the ability to make independent and decisive decisions at all levels of the organization. An officer is in every sense a teacher and a leader. The decisive factor despite technology and weaponry is the value of the individual soldier. The battlefield requires soldiers who can think and act independently, who can make calculated, decisive, and daring use of every situation, and who understand that victory depends upon each individual. Okay? So you think perhaps of military as being tell everybody what to do, but the concept of make sure that everybody is able to think for themselves is what really works. So now we go to another war, lots of wars, and this is, um, 1940s, and that is actually IBM Poughkeepsie plant, and uh, the workers there are mostly women, because uh, of course most of the men are over in Europe or someplace like that, and there's a need for wartime material to be produced, and um, in that time women had very little experience in industrial, I mean actually nobody was in factories until like 20 or 30 years before that, and women didn't work in factories until there was need for production and no men to do it. So you had a very inexperienced workforce that needed to be trained, trained very rapidly. And what did they do? They went and they dusted off that instructor, the man in the job book that had been written 20 years before by Charles Allen. And they said, oh, this looks like a good idea. And after a full start, they decided the first thing to do is to train first line supervisors who should be masters at their job. So you have a few people that know how to do the job. What you gotta do is train the supervisors how to train, how to um, train the workers to do the job. And it was divided into three parts, job instruction, which is how to train workers, basically break down the job into parts and teach each person how to do each part, how to improve the way work is done, and how to treat workers with respect, okay? Job methods, how to improve. So it wasn't teach people how to do things, it was teach them how to do things and then constantly improve the process and also teach workers with respect. Now remember, they're making munitions that haven't actually ever been made before. Airplanes, those were kind of new. 
and things like that. And so they had to figure out how to manufacture them, so they had to constantly improve the process and how to treat workers with respect. Now, this is, uh, was a very successful training, training program. In fact, um, in this quote here, it says, without question, the most successful corporate training program in the history of the United States. About 1.7 million people were certified and trained. At the same time, we had Deming. This is uh, uh, W. Edwards Deming uh, at that time. And what he did was he taught statistical process control, basically to defense contractor engineers and technicians, training over 30,000 people. These two programs were extraordinarily successful in increasing productivity in um, the United States and in Canada, basically in North America. And um, however, they were war programs. And when the war was over, they were dropped pretty much. Except, you know, um, they were moved to countries that seemed to need them because they didn't have any infrastructure. And these programs were brought to Germany and especially to Japan. And in Japan, they were very interested in these programs. And um, so both TW and I and SBC went and were taught in Japan in the early 1950s. So for example, here's the materials from training within industry. Um, it was introduced in Japan in the, as I said, late 40s and 50s. And all three sections were very well received, but most importantly, the job instruction one. How to train workers through their supervisor, how to break down the job into details and train, is to this day one of the pillars of the supervisory training program in Japan. It's a 10-week program where you have a half a day and then you do the stuff. And at the bottom of the training materials that we have some on another slide, I don't, I don't have it here. Uh, it says, if the learner hasn't learned, the teacher hasn't taught. So the burden is on the supervisor to make sure that the people know how to do the job. Job methods, how to constantly improve stuff, was pretty good. But Tichi Ono, the guy that invented the Toyota production system, had a better way to do that. So eventually, he had it improved. And to this day, the improvement on that is taught um, in, in uh, Toyota, too. And then here's Deming. He went in 1950s to Japan. And um, he was kind of annoyed because he, he got ignored in the US after the war was over. And um, he said it's much more than statistical process control. It's the whole system. So he gave lectures to the tune of, you have to appreciate not just the piece you're doing, but the entire system. Uh, you have to understand variation. And Deming, when he talked about variation, he said, the thing you have to realize about variation is that there's two kinds. There's the stuff you can't do anything about and the stuff you can do something about. So there's common cause. It's just there. And there's special cause. And um, it's a good idea to find out if there's a cause, what the cause is, and fix it. But it's not a good idea to try to get ri rid of variation that's just plain inherent in the system. If you try to do that, you actually are going to make the system worse. And he had a training course. I have a brother-in-law who went to it in the uh, 80, uh, yeah, late 80s. And he would, uh, he would uh, have somebody like you come up here, and he would say, here, here's a bag. It's got some marbles in it. I only want you to get white ones out of it. And you put your hand in blind. And if you got white ones, he would say, you are good. And then he'd have you come up. And you would put your hand in. You'd get a black one. And he would ball you out and tell you, you should, I told you not to pull out any blacks. What do you, you know, what don't you understand about that? And, um, and then I'll tell you what, try again. Here's some money. Now put your hand in and, and, and don't pull out any blacks. And if you get only whites, you get this money. Didn't work. Okay, and the point is that if variation is inherent in the system, no amount of yelling, no amount of money is going to change that. You have to change the system instead. He also talked about the theory of knowledge, that is to use the scientific method, not scientific managed, but, but scientific method, in order to solve problems. Think about it, create hypothesis, do experiments, or sometimes called plan, do, check, act. You've heard of that. And then psychology. When it comes to people, it's not numbers. It's pride. It's commitment. It's pride in your work. It's applause. It's trust that matters. It's not um, making sure that numbers are met. And he was very big on that po policy, too. Somehow, we seem to have forgotten some of that stuff. Anyway, um, in the 1950s, another thing was going on in the US, and that was the Cold War, another war. 
And, it, and, and, and you are going to see here that war tends to bring out good behavior. Uh, this was the Polaris project. It was one of the most successful weapons projects in the US. And what it was was a weapons program that was triggered by a scare. The scare was, oh my gosh, uh, Sputnik went up, and we're going to get uh, you know, uh, missiles coming at us. We had better put some missiles underwater at sea and patrol. This project was supposed to take like 10 years, nine years. But um, everybody was worried, so they changed the schedule and started launching submarines that could patrol with uh, underwater missile launching capability in three years. So they took a nine-year impossible schedule and made it into three-year schedule. It was an amazing feat. And um, guess where PERT came from? You've heard of PERT and all of its derivatives. It actually came from the Polaris program. Now, there's a guy that evaluated this program because after the Polaris success, its success was attributed to this wonderful management technique called PERT. And so um, Her Harry Harvey Sapolsky um, decide, was asked to do a sort of a check it all out, interview all of the people, and he was allowed to do an independent summary of what actually went on in the Polaris project. Um, PERT was a management system that uh, Rear Admiral Rayburn thought was just told the whole world, and Congress especially, was the one thing that was going to make this program so much an assured success that they didn't have to worry about it. And really, what Sapolsky says is it was a um, facade to keep Congress happy. If Congress thought it wasn't people, it was the system that was going to make it work, they would keep funding it. Actually, in practice, it wasn't really used to manage the program day to day, not for the first four or five years when they launched the submarine. And in fact, the technical officers thought it was unreliable, and the, the, the contractors thought it was relatively worthless. However, it became the gold standard against which we decided that we should manage projects after that. Honest. And Sapolsky said, why was the Polaris really successful? Was it really this management tracking system, or was it something else? And he put in there, quality of leadership was first. The technical director, who was Levering Smith, maintained control not only over all of the engineering drawings, but also over the description of success. What an interesting thing. So over the time, every iteration, which was about 18 months to two years, he got to define what was success at the end. So he decided when he knew what he could do, well, we're going to define that as success, and then that would be the next goal. And they would meet it because you know he knew they could. So he got control over that, and he also had control over all the interfaces. And he focused everybody on nothing but get this thing in the water. In fact, the very first week, two weeks, when he got signed, he said, let's see, how can we do this fast? You know, somebody's building a submarine down there, and I forget where, and it's about half done. He said, tell you what, why don't you take that submarine, cut it in half, stretch it out, I think it was 16 feet, and then put it back together, and we'll figure out how to put missiles in that 16 feet. And he did that like within two or three weeks after he got started. And yep, to this day, that is the standard length of what a missile submarine carries is 16 feet. Why? Because it seemed like a good number at the time, and he had to have one fast. Uh, that was about it. <laughs> the number of missiles was because he talked to a lot of the submarine captains and talked about what they would be comfortable with. And those decisions were made within the first month. Um, he had a decentralized, competitive organization. They had 10 fundamental technologies they had to invent in a very short time. So what he did was for every technology, every subsystem technology, he had three or four competing vendors competing to be able to have the honor of putting that in there. Now, imagine a government program doing that today. Kind of interesting. Um, and uh, we call that set-based design in, uh, in design in hardware design, that is, have multiple options, and when you get to the decision point, you choose the best one, which is what he did. Emphasis on reliability. If there was one thing that uh, Smith was criticized for, it was being too much of a fanatic about testing. Those of you who know Agile, hmm. <laughs> so that was his big criticism, and then everybody was really engaged in making this happen. Contractors went out to and had meals with you know government people that wouldn't be allowed today either, um, but it was then, and that's those are the reasons why it was successful. 
So really good kinds of things that we talk about in lean product development were involved in making this successful. Now we go to the 60s, so we're in the next decade, and we have the Toyota production system suddenly coming on the world. It actually had been going since the late 50, early 50s. And here is Teichi Ono, who was involved in making this thing work inside of Toyota. It's very counterintuitive. It seems okay today, kind of makes sense, but you know, when I was in a manufacturing plant in the early 80s, it did not seem very sensible to us. We thought they were nuts. Um, and so did most of the people in Toyota and even the people he managed. So, you know, for the longest time, they didn't call it the Toyota production system. They called it the Ono system, you know, because they figured if it failed, it was his system. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, but he, he kept getting more and more, you know, responsibility. And as more people reported to him, they kind of had to adopt it. And after a while, I discovered it actually worked, as counterintuitive as it is. And so he has a system that's fundamentally about just-in-time flow, which in our plant we thought was nuts, but actually it worked for us too. Um, and stop the line culture. Don't build in anything that has, if you find an error, you stop and fix it. But not only that, if you are building something that might have defects, you need to put in place a mechanism to find the defects the moment they get injected and stop everything and fix them. Don't find them later, find them right on the front. So mistake proofing your manufacturing line and you can think of that as mistake proofing your code with a test structure. Right away, as soon as you do something wrong on the keyboard, I did too when I was programming, you have a mechanism to run it against something, to merge it with other code, find out if something's wrong. If it is, you fix it. No problem. You just did it in the last 10 minutes. You come back 10 weeks later and find out something's wrong. It's a much bigger problem. So that stop the line culture. Mistake proof a system so errors cannot get injected. And lastly, relentless improvement. I'll tell you a little more about that in a minute. So his book was um, this book here, which was written in 78, but didn't become available in English until 88. I wish I could have read it in our plant in the early 1980s, because it really would have helped us. We had a book. It was not very good, but <laughs> it helped. I mean, it was good, but it was not very well translated into English. And it was detailed industrial engineering stuff by Shigeo Shingo. But it was our Bible in figuring out how to do just in time in our plant. This book is really good, and even today it's good. It's a wonderful book to read. And then he wrote another book, which was uh, published in 1982. It was translated then and then recently retranslated into English um, in 2007. And I'm just going to read you one thing because I have here relentless improvement learned through experimentation, which is one of the pillars of the Toyota Way today. And he didn't write much about it in his book. But he did write about it in the workplace management. So for example, this is just one quick example out of that book. He said, um, standard work. Now you all have heard of standard work. Do things one way. Okay. He said, when creating standard work, it's going to be difficult to establish a standard if you are trying to achieve the best way. And we're going back to the scientific method. There's one best way. He says, no, there's not a best way. This is a big mistake. What you really want to do is document exactly what you're doing now. If you make it better, that's Kaizen. That means change for the better. And if not, and you establish the best possible way, there's no motivation for Kaizen. So the idea is you don't want to be perfect, otherwise nobody gets to improve it. That's why one way of motivating people to do Kaizen is to create a poor standard. <laughs> Interesting concept. So remember the goal here is not to have the best way of doing things. It's to motivate people to constantly improve the way things are done. Don't make it too bad, OK? Without some standard, you can't say we made it better because there's nothing to compare it to. So you have to have a standard for comparison. And then you take that standard, and if the work is not easy to perform, you give many suggestions and do Kaizen. And the whole idea is to have all the people that are doing the work constantly improve it. That's Kaizen. So that is his uh, constant improvement is much more important than telling people the right way. And there was this feeling, and I, I, I recognize it because we also had it in our plan, that only people who really knew how to do the job were people who were doing the job. So those are the people who figure out how to do the job. It's true that a supervisor needs to train new people, but it's also true that the people doing the work are the ones with the problems, the issues, and stuff like that. And they're the ones who should be constantly improving it. 
So in the 1970s, we had theory X and theory Z. You've heard of those? OK, theory X. Most people dislike work and don't give their best efforts at their job. Therefore, people must be encouraged with financial incentives or threats to work towards organizational or objectives. Generally, people would rather avoid responsibility and prefer people to tell them what to do. Now, there are plenty of people that actually believe this. I don't happen to be one of them. I haven't observed it to be true. But there are people who kind of, you can tell from their behavior that they think this. And then there are, of course, they don't tend to be the people that are being directed. They tend to be the people that are doing the directing. And then there's Theory Z. And Theory Z became popular when people discovered that what was going on in Japan was actually more successful than what was going on in the US. And thought, hmm, let's see, what's this all about? So there was a book even written by Theory Z. Theory X came from uh, McGregor, and Theory Z came from Ochi. There was a Theory Y, too, but I'll skip that. And Theory Z says, on the contrary, People are motivated by the satisfaction of doing a good job, the enjoyment of cooperating with others and being recognized by them, and the satisfaction of using one's talents to the fullest. Fundamental difference in perception of what motivates people. And this is, became the basis of what was going on. In fact, you can see this in a book, for example, by Ishikawa. How many have heard of Ishikawa diagrams? They're cause and effect diagrams? OK, well. Those of you who haven't, they're pretty good. Uh, anyway, this is that same Ishikawa. And he wrote the book, uh, What is Total Quality Control? And um, this is in, um, it was in the, I think it was in the early 70s, because otherwise I wouldn't have it on this slide, right? <laughs> and and um, so he was from the 50s, a, a very strong leader of the quality movement in Japan, which really was what was patterned, what the quality movement moving to the US in the early 80s was patterned on. And Ishikawa proves in many of his writings that this theory Z is the fundamental perception of what that whole told quality movement was built on. He said in the book, the fundamental principle of successful management is to allow subordinates to make full use of their ability. Sounds a little bit more like the, you know, the, the war manual than the uh, scientific management. Everyone who is connected with the company must be able to feel comfortable and happy with the company and make use of his capabilities to realize his potential. A lot in his writings about people must be able to realize their full potential and it's management's job to set up the situation so that they can. Top managers and middle managers must be bold enough to delegate as much authority as possible and that is the way to establish respect for humanity as your management philosophy. Now, this is not a delegate's delegation so you can assign blame, you know, back to train wreck management. This is a delegation so people can work to their full potential. And that's theory Z. So, uh, you know, I have a book on my shelf that I bought in about 19, uh, you know, late 1970s. And it was, maybe I think it was the early part of the 80s, called Theory Z Management. And it was all about how, you know, some people might think this, but this is what actually really works. Um, I was lucky enough to be in a company where Theory Z was kind of the philosophy anyway, so that was very handy. Um, and um, just about that time, I had been working in, in, in uh, process control, and I did a process monitoring system for videotape manufacturing. And my system went into a plant about 60 or 70 miles from where we lived. And they invited me to come out and be the IT manager in the plant. So I'd never been a manager before, and it was a little scary because, you know, I read books that say management's different than being a technical person. And I was a really good technical person, and I had no clue if I'd be any good at a manager, but I thought I'd give it a try. And it was kind of fun, actually. Um, we went to the plant. I went to the plant, and uh, my boss, Dave Dolger, who was the plant manager, said, so, you know, you own responsibility for systems. Now, systems are not just computers. They're anything that makes things work around this place. And I actually spent four years taking computers out of the plant. Because we had um, this thing at that time. You know, computers had just learned how to do scheduling. And they were used first and foremost to schedule manufacturing plants, this thing called MRP, Material Requirements Planning. So back in those days, there, was MRP, there were MRP systems, and they said, if you would just do what the MRP system tells you to do exactly, then your plant will be perfect. 
And if you're not perfect, then you're just not trying hard enough. Now our plant at that point packed out about, for every week we'd schedule what we wanted to do and we'd look ahead and all, about 60% of our weekly plan. We just weren't trying hard enough, right? 60% of plan. And um, the other problem we had was that our competition started selling video cassettes, which is what we made, for a whole lot less money than we could make them for. So this was really serious. We weren't actually, we were doing all the right things according to the book, and they were doing stuff in Japan that was so much better that they, we thought they were dumping. Nope, they were making stuff better, they were making stuff higher quality than us, and they were getting it over to the US and selling it at less than we could make it for, and they were making money. I'm thinking, whoa, either we gotta close this plant or we gotta do something like dramatically different. We decided that we didn't believe in this, at first we didn't believe in this thing called just in time, but you know, the more we studied it, the more we thought, well, oh, it seems to be what's working for them as much as it doesn't make sense. So we, there was a small just in time movement in the US. There weren't any real consultants, maybe one or two. And there was a little tiny group. This is sort of like agile software development in 1999, right? And uh, so we went and we learned about it and we gave it a try because it was that or close the plant. And uh, the, uh, what we did was we took a conference table about like this big, we laid out paper, we drew all of our processes on it, and then Gary Esping, the materials control manager, produced a weekly packout. And then we had coffee cups, and in the coffee cups we had, as you can see, little sticks, and this co each coffee cup was a, a, cart a, a cart of video cassettes, say a thousand video cassettes stacked in a cart. And, um, and that said, the stick here said, this is, uh, you know, T120 black or T120 red. This is what kind of video cassette, what color, how many minutes, that sort of thing. And so we pretended that those were carts, and then we had some carts ready to pack out. And what we did was we simulated all, no computer systems. All we did was we had a pack out. We, we started with some inventory. We started packing out, and when we used a, one of those cups, we would take the stick and we bring it down to the next process on the table and we say, okay, process, make that. And then we would simulate having that process make some more of that and see what we would need to do to be able to pack out. So we simulated a pulse system and after a few hours, it kind of worked. So we said, hey, this is cool. But there were three of us and this is a plant with a thousand people and a lot of complicated processes, all scheduled by my computers. And um, so we decided we better get the general managers to come in and take a look. And so the next Saturday, the general managers came in to take a look at this, and the five of us simulated this. And they said, yeah, it might work. Seems like a pretty interesting concept, but you know, we're just managers. We can't make this happen. And remember, there's no IEs around. There's no consultants to help us. So we have to figure this out for ourselves. And so um, the general manager said, we better call in the general supervisors because they could help us. So then two weeks later, the general supervisors came in on Saturday, and we spent all day doing this coffee cup simulation and the thing. With these dozen or so people, we were able to do a much more detailed simulation and it kept locking up after like 24 to 48 hours. And so we changed the rules, we changed all sorts of stuff, went to lunch, had a big break, came back, changed some more rules, and suddenly we got it right, we got the idea of level loading, and we were able to simulate one full week of pack out with no lockup. Yes! So we thought, wow, this is pretty cool. So the general supervisor said, yeah, but you know, like, we can't make this happen. There's a lot of detail work here. We better get the supervisors involved. So then the general managers, general supervisors, the shift supervisors all walked through the simulation on the three shifts because we were three, three shifts a day, six days a week. And they all walked through it. And they said, whoa, this is, you know, kind of interesting. It might work, actually. But we're just, you know, we're, we're just the bosses around here and there's a lot of work so we better show this to all the shift workers. So everybody that was involved, which is like 90% of the plant, went through this simulation. And then the shift supervisors with their teams on their shifts figured out with the, uh, the uh, you know, opposing shifts how to make it work in their area. How to put the little cards in, what things were going to happen. Because remember, all my computers were going to get turned off one day, one day because we couldn't figure out how to phase it in had to be cold turkey. And one weekend we did, we turned off the computers and we printed out the week's pack out 
and we sent it to packing and held our breath, okay? And by the end of that week, guess what our pack out percentage was? 95%. Now remember, we'd never done much better than 60 or 65% trying this MRP thing forever. It just couldn't be done. And suddenly we started a pull system, and wow, we could pack out basically everything we wanted every single week. Pull systems do that for you, you know, and if you try it in any other kind of schedule, and you'll see the same thing. But that's not the idea here. The lesson is that we couldn't have done this without engaging all of the people in the plant to figure out how to make it happen. Why did we get 95%? Because guess who figured out how to make it work? Wasn't some, you know, people coming in from outside saying, you put this here and put this here. It was the shift supervisors puzzling through with their shifts and the people next to them how they were going to make it work. Something goes wrong, guess what? People who have to deal with the problems have already simulated that, kind of know what to do, make some adaptations, figure it out. And that's why it worked. Because the people doing the processes just design their own processes. So it wasn't like we went to the people in the plant and said, oh dear, we are in bad trouble, what do you think we should do? That isn't what we did, we said, we're in bad trouble, we have a plan. We're pretty sure that this is going to make things better. We're not sure how much, but we think it's worth a shot. Here's the general idea, and we'll show you with a simulation in detail, give you all the help you need to work it out, but in the end, you got to figure it out and make it work yourself. So there was a lot of leadership from the management team, but in the end, the details were worked out by the people on the floor, and that's kind of my vision of leadership. Um, in addition to the fact that... Um, uh, I also got an interesting taste in my mouth as far as outsiders coming in and telling people how to do stuff. I'm pretty convinced that if we had a bunch of outsiders coming in and telling us how to do stuff, we wouldn't have been successful, anywhere near as successful as us puzzling this out, figuring it out, banging our heads against the wall, getting everybody involved in, admittedly, uh, you know, it was a close the plant or figure it out situation, so it's not like we had a choice but it was everybody getting engaged and figuring out how to make it work. So um, that was the result. Uh, and the employee said it was the best thing that ever happened in the plant. So this, if Japan can't, why can't we? That's up there because there was a video in the early 1980s about Japan being so good all of a sudden when they used to, you know, before this, Japan was known for making cheap junk. Do anybody remember those days when Japan was cheap junk? Okay, well, it didn't happen at about 19, late 1970s. That kind of changed around. And by 1980, it was, huh, why can't we do that? And this video was made with Deming in it, and Deming got rediscovered. And from 1980 until 1993 when he died. And by the way, he was born in 1900. So he got rediscovered when he was 80, worked until he was 93 and basically kind of turned Ford around and lots of other people. And um, many of the things that you read of from him came from that, that time. Now let's talk about the 1990s. Actually, in the 1990s, I was not in computers. I was working in product development in 3M, which is a fun thing to do, because 3M kind of does new product development for a living. I still think that Google has copied a lot of 3M ideas, like our 15% time and things like that. <laughs> but, um, you know, so I kind of get some of those ideas. And I think highly of Google, because I kind of thought highly of 3M, and there's a lot of similar culture there. But in the 1990s, I was doing product development with plastics, not, not well, I had some with embedded software and some with plastics. And um, I was what I'll show you later, product champion most of the time. And so what was going on in software at that time was kind of hidden from me. But uh, we had this thing called Waterfall, as Jack Cook told you, I didn't hear about till the end of the decade. You, you've seen that, yeah, okay. And then there was this process maturity model yeah, we saw that too. <laughs> I learned about this one in 1999, actually, honest. And then we had, um, you know, project management in all sorts of flavors. Good old Pert coming back to haunt everybody. And the, the thing, uh, thing about this in particular is that having moved from a scheduling system that was push to a pull system and seeing the difference I never believe that if you guys would only try harder to meet your project deadlines, you know, it all would be perfect. 
probably you'll get 60% performance against plan on a week-to-week -week basis. Anything that's scheduled at a detailed level, that's pretty much what you get. And if you switch to a pull system instead, you'll probably do a whole lot better. So um, there's this pulse push system here. And then there's uh, Six Sigma. And I never was too much involved. Uh, 3M got involved in that after I left. And so there was lots of process, OK? In fact, there were some companies, they still, some of them exist, which think that process is going to solve all of our problems. If you just have a standard process, anybody can do it. Everybody in the company should have the same process if they're doing the same thing. Should be the standard across the company. Um, interesting ideas. It's not like process is wrong because you know we had a lot of process improvement we had to constantly do in our plant. But making it the be all and end all and so we can have fungible people and so that um, everybody does exactly the same thing means forget process improvement, forget constantly having new ideas from people, forget people working to their maximum of their potential. So I want to tell you about plank roads, just because I want to tell you about plank roads. This is a plank road, and it's in the mid-1980s, 1840s to 1850s. Do you ever hear about plank roads? In uh, the US, in Milwaukee, where I live, we have this road called Watertown Plank Road. It goes to Watertown. So what happened was um, railroads came into the country about this time. You saw that at the beginning. And there was a massive boom in plank road construction because they wanted to get stuff from the farm to the city where the railroad station was. And so there wasn't a whole lot of money around, so they thought we'd start up these little businesses where people would pay to have this plank road put in and um, get a lot of investors, and it would be paid for with tolls. The tolls were generally regulated by the state. So instead of building roads, the state just had these, these laws for you know, one cent a mile or something like that. And um, they were amazingly successful. And, you know, you find this hard to believe because you haven't ever seen one, but actually there were immediate positive results. Far superior to muddy, rutted roads, dramatic decrease in travel time, expand, much expanded rural markets. So they were very, very successful. And therefore, well, they got built all over the country. You can look in the southeast, you can look in the Midwest, you can look all across New York, and you're going to find that huge numbers of plank roads were built. But there was a problem. The investment period was 10 years for payoff. That's what it was sold as. Turns out, after something like four years, they started to die. They, you know, wood rots and uh, about four years later, Every single plank road within four years after it was built had to have serious maintenance. In fact, um, which was less than half the projected life screen. And annual costs for maintenance were, for instance, 20 to 30% of the initial cost. And guess what? That money didn't exist. It hadn't even paid back its initial investment. So stuff would rot out, and they would take out the wood and put in gravel. And in the end, all the plank roads ended up becoming gravel roads. But when they were gravel, they were no longer toll roads. And they basically got maintained by the state. So that's the story of plank roads. They were amazingly successful at first, but they, as Jim uh, Sorsky says in The Wisdom of Clouds, the first plank roads were a huge success. People looking for a solution to the road problem found a ready-made one at hand. As more people built plank roads, their legitimacy became more entrenched and the desire to consider alternate solutions shrank. It was years before the fundamental weakness of the plank roads that they didn't last long enough became obvious. Okay, it's sort of like for every problem there is a solution that is fast, cheap, and wrong. And this is one of those. And so to go back to our process chart, I think for every problem there is a solution that is quick, cheap, and wrong. And Heavy processes happen to be in that category, in my view. Um, just a quick, this isn't actually fair, but I thought I wouldn't pick on the software processes. But there is this uh, interesting thing that was reported in Fortune, 5, in Fortune magazine in July. Of 58 large companies that have announced Six Sigma programs, 91% have trailed the S&P ever since. <laughs> well, anyway. Um, what really makes organizations work is not one standard process and fungible people that do exactly what's written down. That's going back to Taylor. That doesn't work. 
least not in my experience. So let's look at organizations that are what I'm going to call high reliability organizations. That is organizations where mistake is a matter of life and death. For example, firefighters, nuclear power plants, power grid dispatching centers, hospital emergency rooms, air traffic control, air traffic carriers, those kinds of places. Think about an aircraft carrier. I mean, the planes don't have a lot of place to land and a lot of place to take off and there's huge amounts of potential for accident and they're going to be fatal if they happen most of the time. High reliability organizations have more than their fair share of unexpected events and they persistently have less than their fair share of accidents. And they really relate to this because our plant worked in almost exclusively highly explosive chemicals. That's basically what you know, the, happens in our plants. When I did computer control systems, I had to put my computers in class one group D enclosures. Those of you who have been in explosion environments know that that means that no spark, you know, it's got pressure out so that no spark can get, um, so that no spark from the computer pressure in, so no spark can get up kind of thing. And so um, in our plant, um, actually in all 3M labs, all labs have an explosion wall in case you know, whatever blows up in there it just will collapse out. It's happened once or twice. Um, uh, we, had a, we had a plant, uh, we had a fire once and the plant manager was really pleased it was in our coating area. Lasted about 15 minutes. He says, the first time in the plant that a woman caused the fire, a woman found it and a woman put it out. <laughs> and um, because he was proud of that. But anyway, we had, we had an occasional disaster too. And I was involved in a startup at the Oklahoma City plant where um, I was doing a startup. I was sitting in the control room and the project manager was there and the alarms went off. And he looked, I looked at him. He says, eh, they're just testing the alarms today. And then all of a sudden the guy got up and shot out of the room and I says, hmm, just testing, sure. And, and they weren't. So I went out and here's this cloud of smoke. What is it? It's CO2. Now CO2 sits in all three implants by the coder head because if there's a fire, that's what you got to do is suppress it immediately with CO2. But if you're a person and you get suppressed with CO2, you're going to also get suppressed. So this is not a good thing. And this is a startup. Startups are the most dangerous time in any kind of an environment. And here was this huge cloud of CO2. Question is, was the area clear? Now, fortunately for everybody, the plant engineer happened to be at the coder room door when this happened, and he was smart enough and he always knew exactly what to do because he lived in that plant. He cleared the area, and by the time the project manager got down there, the plant engineer had everything under control, knew that the area was clear. But it was scary because, as, you know, when you get involved in life-critical situations, you have a huge emphasis on safety. In our plant, we had somebody did nothing but make sure everybody understood safety. Um, the common characteristic of these kinds of organizations is mindfulness. This is a very interesting book about these kinds of organizations by, um, uh, let's see, White. Yeah, White and Shercliffe. And it's called Managing the Unexpected, Assuring High Performance in an Age of Complexity. And what they say is that in these kinds of things, nuclear power plants, aircraft carriers, that sort of thing, mindfulness is the thing that makes things work, is the thing that you have to have throughout the culture of the organization in order to have high reliability. What is that? It's preoccupation with failure, which sounds strange. Why are we preoccupied with failure? Think about it. You have to always expect that something's going to go wrong and always be prepared for it. There's none of this, life is good, just, just ignore all those little problems. You can't ignore issues. You never ignore issues. You make sure that you're always aware that something unexpected could happen and you're prepared for it because it can. Anything that can go wrong will eventually go wrong. You know, if you're building something that's going to be in a transaction processing environment someday in your code, and you say, well, that'll happen once in a million or once in two million times, you know it's going to happen. Someday it's going to bring some system down and it's going to cost one whole lot of money if that transaction system gets tied up for an hour or two. Um, a lot more than it would cost you to pay attention to it on the front. Reluctance to simplify. The fact is we live in a complex, unpredictable world and standard procedures cannot replace thinking people. So you will not, you will find, oh, like I went to an airport and it was very interesting. I was watching a driver 
and he had a, you know, a luggage cart behind him, and he got out of the luggage cart, and he seemed to be totally absent-minded as he walked to the front of the luggage cart, took these uh, two triangles that were sitting there, put one by each wheel, and then went off and did whatever. It was so routine, I'm sure he didn't even think, he didn't look like he was thinking about what he was doing. But to him, stopping a car meant chucking the wheels. There was no question. It just like was so automatic, it happened. You could see how automatic his reactions were. That's what happens here. You, you have standard procedures. You must check the wheels. But you also have everybody paying attention to make sure that that, doesn't, that, that, that happens. Um, sensitivity to operations. What you really have to do is be attentive to the front line where the work gets done. And it's called in, uh, in uh, to Toyota production system, go to the Gemba. Go where things work. And an aircraft carrier, the, the head of the, I don't forget which color, the admiral, will spend time on the deck because that's the only place you can really feel what's happening. Commitment to resilience. You have to take every single smallest incident that happens and deal with it. Stop, investigate, find the first root cause, and fix it. And also, you have to have deference to expertise. Doesn't matter if you're the most senior guy in the ship. The experts are the ones who really understand the technology and how to do the, the detail stuff. So you use mission command, not detail command. I'm going to talk about mission command versus detail command later. So you just have to remember that for a minute. Oh, no, it's next. Mission command versus detail command. Ta-da. <laughs> OK, so this is straight out of uh, the uh, Armed Forces Command and Control book. It's called um, Mission Command, Command Forces, and it's about um, what constitutes command and control in the U.S. Armed Forces. And by the way, it's an interesting book. It doesn't have, it doesn't have a copyright. It says, please use this however you want. So that's why I get to copy it. And it defines very clearly there's Mission Command and Detail Command. And Mission Command, if you look at it, assumes that war, or whatever it is you're doing, economic war, you name it, um, is, if you're in detail command, deterministic and predictable. But if you want mission command, what if war is probabilistic and unpredictable? Then maybe you have a different approach. It accepts mission command that there is disorder, there is uncertainty, and therefore it tends to lead to decentralization, spontaneity, Informality, loose rein, self-discipline, initiative, cooperation, acceptable decisions faster rather than optimal decisions later. I think we sit over here. And so the kind of leadership you need is there. Now that's command and control. So I don't like the term command and control is bad because people tend to think that command and control means detailed command. But in army manuals, that's not actually what it means at all. It means both of these. And when you have this kind of an environment over here, which is all of these probabilistic and other things, then you want mission command versus detail command. So where does software fit in? I think it fits over here, just like, just like those high reliability organizations fit over there. So now where does software fit in? Um, when I was at 3M, I was what, with that last decade in the 90s, I was what was called a product champion. And I'm going to call it for purposes of now a product leader, or at Toyota, this person would be called a chief engineer. Um, so when you're developing a product, it is really important for the organization to make sure that they get the right thing, they get what people really want. And, and I was a very big advocate, and I still am, of making sure that when people are working on a product, they talk to potential customers, they walk in their shoes, they understand them. But when push comes to shove, it, you don't leave important decisions up to a vote. Somebody takes the responsibility for making the ultimate decisions. Uh, or maybe you can have a committee vote. But if the committee votes, you know, then who's responsible? Or maybe you can have a marketing person say, oh, all of our competitors are doing this. Maybe we ought to do the same thing. But, you know, that's not going to give you the next generation product either. So instead, um, when you need to, in the end, have somebody that really is deciding what a product wants to be, this is a leader. Not somebody that tells everybody what to do, but somebody has a vision. And at Toyota, and actually at 3M, the, chief in, the, the um, champion was exactly very similar. Responsible for business success. And it was okay to have failures, too, because if you didn't have a few failures, you weren't trying 
which probably sounds familiar at Google, right? You don't have a few failures, you're not trying. But you got to have also responsible for business success, develops deep customer understanding. So this, this product leader is responsible to really understand customers and bring the team out to understand customers, develops the product concept, but note, creates the high level systems design. The chief engineer at Toyota is one of the most skilled technical people in the company. Highly skilled engineer. At 3M, the product champion was 95 or 98 percent of the time a highly skilled technical person, not from marketing. Um, didn't mean you didn't get marketing input, but the vision had to marry the available technology with the market need and that was generally done through the eyes of somebody who really got the technology and then understood the market. And that is also the same concept that Toyota has with their chief engineer. Sets the schedule. That's interesting. Um, I can talk more about that later if we have time if you ask questions. But the chief engineer sets the schedule, decides product concept to release is going to be 15 months, sets the major milestones, and that's what happens understands what the customers will value and conveys this to the engineers making the day-to-day trade-offs by walking around and talking to them, by making sure they understand the metaphor of what you're trying to accomplish. And this is important. The chief engineer has deep knowledge of the technical details, not every technical detail, but certainly is a highly competent technical person, arbitrates trade-offs when necessary, and defends the vision. And what is the chief engineer or the product leader defending the vision against or from? Well, then we have other people here. In a classic matrix organization, anyway, you have another kind of leader. This is what we would call a department leader, functional leader at 3M. So you have a product development process of some sort. And the end is to create not just a product, but a value stream that brings in some money somehow. And you have somebody who has a vision and understands technical opportunities and really understands the market and knows how to create some outcomes valued by customers so that you can get some money in. And then you have a development team that works. And the important thing here is these technical people that are developing the product are also learning stuff. And one of the things in any product development process is that you're not just developing a product, you are developing knowledge that will be used in future products. And that has to be captured or you just relearn it. You dump it on the ground. So you have useful knowledge. Where does it go? And like in uh, my product, for example, I was working on light fiber. And we had a lot of optics. And I'm a mathematician. I got the optics. But we had a lot of chemistry. And I'm actually not a chemist. So we also created a lot of chemical inventions. And we had to have places for that to be have a home. So here is where somebody who protects the knowledge of a particular technical area will come in and create functional expertise. Whether it's how do we do user interaction design, how do we do security, how do we do chemistry, whatever, or in, in our case it was how do we do microstructured surfaces, how do we do ultra-pure plastics, you know, detailed, how do we do a specific area of chemistry. So I had access to like some of the best people in the world in the chemistry environment in the areas that I was working in. And it's because they had a functional home where they had their equipment, their material, their, their um, processes, and they could do experiments and bring it into the product. So the product leader and then the functional leaders. And then what happens here is as these functional people with deep knowledge get assigned into teams, they bring good decisions, integration thinking, Innovation comes from this deep technical knowledge brought to bear on a new product that people are trying to develop. So that matrix of somebody leading the product and somebody understanding the underlying technologies is where I'm thinking about in product development in general, and certainly even in software development, a, an idea of leadership. This kind of leadership of the product and leadership of the technical expertise. So I'll look at it this way. When you have a really important, brilliant product, you need to understand, you need to have somebody that really understands the market, that has business responsibility, customer understanding, overall planning anyway, trade-offs. And you need to have technical leadership. You need an architecture. 
you need some technical guidance on trade-offs and integration and stuff like that. And that's what I call the product leader. Product leader can be one or two people. If it's two people, however, Intuit, for example, always does this with two people. They have a brand manager up top, and they're very good at that because their history, you know, they were founded by Steve Cook, who's a brand, you know, Procter & Gamble brand manager graduate. And then they have a technical leader, and these two, joined at the hip, working closely together, direct the product. So you can do this with two or one, but my observation is brilliant products have both. Some way to understand the market and understand timing, and some way to understand the underlying technical capabilities married in the head of a very, you know, one or two people, which then bring in a technical team. But you need one other kind of thing. You need, let's go back to the training within industry. Supervisor's job is to act as a teacher, make sure people who are new know how to do things, solve problems, set standards, constantly improve, and make sure that everybody that's there is assigned into jobs and career paths where they can reach their full potential. Somebody that's taking care of people. And so somehow that role and these roles become my vision of the important leadership roles in any development organization, whether it's software or whatever. Now we have some other people we see around. We see process leaders, okay? And if you have a new process, it doesn't hurt to have process coaches. But over time, that needs to become embedded in the organization and become the job of the supervisor, line manager, as opposed to the other way around. And we have these people that call project leaders, worry about funding and scheduling and tracking. We actually didn't have project management as a, uh, a valid title in 3M until the mid to late 90s um, because we had products, but we didn't really have projects. Okay? So the idea here is that if you have overall release planning with people able to meet the schedule based on you know, milestones that they meet, then that is something that can be assumed into that job. So, any questions so far? None. I got sort of, yeah, go ahead. No, I'm mean, thinking partly about myself and partly about yourself. Uh, where, where do consultants fit into this leadership role uh, picture? Well, you know, I actually told you that already. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he wants to know where consultants fit into this picture. The ones that disappear, is that how you see them? You know, at 3M. You didn't have consultants unless you needed help. And your goal in life was not to need help. Okay? So, and remember in our plant, I, I think I mentioned the strong bias against, depending upon consultants. Yes. And so I see consultants as teachers seeding ideas and getting people on the, aligned on the same thinking process so that the management team can get their act together and their head together and figure out in detail what it takes to move forward. Okay? So lots of, lots of things about ideas, but um, not going in and solving the company's problems. The company has to solve its own problems. So new ideas, new ways of thinking about things, new ways of uh, thinking about how to align processes. We, had a, we did have a consultant come into our plant, actually. He was there for a day, looked around the plant, and at the end of the day, he said, you ought to go see the Nabisco factory in Chicago. I mean, we were in, you know, Hutchinson, Minnesota. It was a long ways. But I used to work in Chicago, and I remember them in the Nabisco factory. He says, they make cookies. You know, what you make isn't much different than cookies. But cookies have to be made and gotten to shelves and sold and in people's house and eaten all in a week. It's really fast. Those food companies, they have this problem solved. You ought to figure out how they do it. That was like golden information. It never occurred to me until that time that there were companies that had been doing this for like decades. It's just in time thing. And it was entirely possible if you had perishable items. And in fact, if you look at um, Zara, which does very rapid replenishment of clothing in fashion stores, they treat clothing like perishable food. And in s <laughs> they do. <laughs> So the idea is don't 
figure out what's going to be bought, constantly replenish and rapidly make and move stuff into the market, get it bought and get it used, and have a very, very short cycle time. That's really about all I remember he told us, but it was very interesting, very good idea, very good mental model for us. It's made the whole thing seem possible. Oh, maybe those guys in Japan weren't so nuts. Actually, if they could do it in Nabisco, surely we were smart enough to do it too. That's what we figured. We were young and we were kind of foolish, but we were actually also quite successful. So um, consultants can see ideas, but in the end, the company has to figure out how to solve its problems. And pretty much, I look at a management team that has, you know, close responsibility for the um, lives of maybe you know a few hundred people getting aligned and thinking alike and figuring out how to change that world and that kind of group of 500,000 people with you know a, a group of management or you know eight or ten that can talk to each other not 50 that kind of group can make dramatic changes fast if you're talking about three or four thousand people that need to be changed I'm thinking yeah, I don't think so. So, <laughs> so I don't try to go there. Um, so that's, um, and I have this bias because I really did not spend my life being a consultant. I spent my life in a, as a manager in a large corporation in which if you had to have a consultant, you weren't really doing your job. And I have that bias to this day, although they do have some good roles. <laughs> I come from a financial services firm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, we used to rely on consultants because we used to have things that were sort of, you know, can processes that were replicable in an operations environment or in any business environment. And we used to really rely on them for more an injection of an external perspective. Mm -hmm. Plus, peer yep. uh, from another firm. Makes sense. Really good That's idea. The that, that really <laughs> Especially any process which anybody in your industry can do already. Okay, so if you want them to look at your, you know, precious proprietary things, probably not. But if you, there's a really good process that everybody in the industry has to do, and you're not doing it as well as the others, you better just figure out how everybody else is doing it and either buy it out or, or bring it in. Makes a lot of sense. So you definitely want to make sure that on the stuff that doesn't really matter, you are at least equal to everybody else in your industry. Don't even try to be better, though. What you really want is what are those few things where if you're better, it's going to matter to your market. And those are not where you want the consultants. Because once you teach the consultants how to do your core important things right, you know, they can sell it to somebody else. But yeah, that's another good spot for consultants is standard processes that must happen correctly within any kind of industry. You have no business doing it worse than anybody else. Okay, once it's known in the industry how to do stuff, I, I remember I was, a, as a process control engineer, one of the things I did was evaluate these computer screens that were used to control processes. And actually, at least in my opinion, and i biased and have a memory then, it might not be quite right, but as I recall, the TDC 2000 or 3000, the Honeywell screen, set the standard for user interaction in process control design. And then I went out to all the other companies that have process control systems, and anybody that didn't look at what Honeywell was doing and invented their own user interaction screen they just, you know, they, they, couldn't, they couldn't come close. And I couldn't really have a lot of respect for the ones that didn't recognize. The standard's been set, just go follow it, instead of trying to invent your own thing, because you're probably not gonna come up with anything better. So there's areas where you definitely should be seeing what everybody else does and either buying it or having helped make it happen. And I'm not even saying anything um, wrong about Six Sigma, because in our plant, if we didn't have really high discipline and good processes, we certainly weren't going to be able to solve our problem and you know, capture the market, and we did. We changed the whole plans around. We dropped the prices dramatically. We had very standard processes, but they were all devised, devised by the people. And the quality program and the Six Sigma programs have many, many things in common. So, you know, nothing against that. That's actually why I picked that one is because I think it has a huge amount of good stuff. As long as you don't think it's going to save your company, because it isn't. The people are. Your statistics were pretty skewed also, the one that 90% of the... Uh, <laughs> it wasn't mine. I was just doing a reason, funny quote there. The reason for that was they were all lost caps. And they couldn't test the Mm-hmm. So who's going to commit to a program like that? Well, I'm not going to chase down that path. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. 
seems that the product leader needs to have both uh, marketing, very deep marketing and very deep technical um, knowledge. Do you find those people? Because so the marketing leader has to have access to deep technical and market, no, to deep marketing knowledge, not have it. So uh, let's take the case of, first of all, I won't answer your second question for a minute, but example is the Lexus, when Toyota decided to do, they decided that they were in a cheap car market and their, their buyers were going up and getting more money and they better have a luxury car. So that was a decision by E.G. Toyota, who pretty much said, we need to go this way. And uh, they tapped a very senior marketing executive from the U.S. to figure out how to sell the car because it was a U.S. car. And he wrote a book about it, and he said in that book that the hardest thing he had to do was go back and tell E.G. Toyota that the car could not have the Toyota name. had to have a different brand and because it would have the wrong image. Now, the chief engineer was not figuring out what kind of image the Lexus had to have in the U.S., was not figuring out that it had to have a new distribution market. But the chief engineer was responsible to make sure that that was thought of and that that happened in the same amount of time frame as everything else. So while the, he was doing all of this marketing investigation, he was also going to Japan, talking to the chief engineer and the team like that. So he had access to stuff and understood that an entirely new distribution market, distribution system had to be set up in time for the introduction of the car. And while we're at it, they also had to build complete new manufacturing facility because the tolerances on the car were much tighter than any existing process equipment. So the chief engineer had to know that he had to build a, a value stream new manufacturing capability, complete new distribution system, and a car, and synchronize it. Now, one person didn't do that all by themselves, but they knew that it had to happen and had you know, plenty of help to make the things that they didn't have expertise in happen. So that's the, one person can't do it all. But in the end, somebody ends up being responsible, and in Toyota and in 3M, it usually starts out anyway with new products being a technical person that has the vision of the technology in the market as opposed to the other way around. So where do these people come from? Depends on the company. Depends on if your company values them, they tend to actually grow. So in 3M, we actually didn't have a lot of trouble finding product champions because people loved to be on these teams. It was the best job in the company. Everybody aspired to be a product champion. You could watch them. I worked for, I worked for Roger Appledorn. He invented the overhead projector, and he brought into the company billions of dollars of microstructured surface business. It was an amazing guy. And you know, just to work for him was amazing, and he taught me a lot, and I tried to pass it on to other people. You don't have a few to seed, and you don't respect the job. You won't have the people. But it's actually a really fun job, and when it's there, people will find their way into it that are good. We had a talk two weeks ago at the Lean Product and Process Development Conference in Denver, and this was a talk by somebody from the GE Medical Imaging System. And he was talking about how they decided they were going to have product managers wing-to-wing -wing responsibility for a product, and they had no people like that. So they did their best shot of assigning them, and then they created training, lots of help, a product leader uh, council so they could get together and help each other out, plenty of guidance, but they first decided they really had to have this wing-to-wing -wing ownership responsibility. So it's not people happen by magic, but you can, if you decide this is important, find and grow the people to make it happen. But you have to respect and honor them. It has to be a really the best, well, what I think, best job in a company. More questions? Yeah. You may have answered this already. I didn't need it anymore. I kind of may have elaborated on it for me. But in my organization, and some of the organizations that we've seen, uh, the IT development group, you know, it's a service, right? It's a business. So they don't necessarily have all the business knowledge. So using a quote unquote representative from a particular business function or business unit comes in and is potentially this market leader that you're mentioning, right? Where I see the technical leaders. Nope. Is, well, I, I'm just. <laughs> but go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. From my experience, I've seen that the business unit functional people come in and they, they play more of this role as market leader. And then from your development team, your technical group, maybe an architect, a project manager, or a business analyst plays more of that technical leader role. Mm -hmm. 
So when you start saying that you have a product leader here and, and it's the best job that's out there, do you see it mostly as that in those individuals from the IT services that are playing more of the product leader role, or do you see it more as those business representatives or those business leaders coming in and playing more of that marketing? So IT is an interesting situation because it's a service organization into an organization that then provides products into the market. So you're like a, a, a layer removed from where the money is. And um, I've seen some interesting stuff from McKinsey about how the best way to run in a situation like that is to create a product manager role inside of IT and not believe everything that the business does, but actually figure out what they, help them to figure out what they really need in order to be profitable because, or you know, in order to get productivity out of your services. Because if you just do everything they say and it's one person, what if they get it wrong? And how are you walking in their shoes and really understanding how it works? And so if uh, one model is to be actually a product company and sell your products into, the rest of the company. There are other models too, but it's a struggle in that particular situation to figure out where the real ownership is because you are one level removed from where the real value is. And you need to get close to the value in order to have the vision of what you're trying to do. You, you remember that report? Uh, it's, about, um, it's about banks, for example, in Spain and, and in Europe, and it's about three or four years old. And if you check it out or give me an email, I can probably send you the reference. So if you're at McKinsey, give it a, <laughs> give me a, send me an email. Any more? So I'll just wrap up with my last story. And that is a story about um, a philosopher in Italy that was uh, strolling through a quarry some decades ago. And he went up to some stone cutters and he says, so what are you building? I mean, you know, philosophers do crazy things. So the first thing he said was to the first fellow he ran into, so what are you doing? And he said, you know, what do you think I'm doing? What does it look like? I'm cutting stones. I don't like this job. I hate it. I have to do it because I can't get any other job, and it's really hot dirt. Go away. I'm going to talk to you. Whew. Okay. So being an you know, intrepid philosopher, he goes on to the next fellow, and he says, what are you doing? And he says, I'm earning a living. I'm putting food on the table, house over my family, you know, I'm earning a living. And uh, well, actually, that wasn't such a bad response. He felt a little bit better. But you know, you got to always check out three different sources. That's my theory, too. You can't ask just, you can't read one book on anything. You can't talk to one people or person, everything. You got to check out three. So he goes to the third person and he says, So what are you doing? And he said, I'm building a cathedral. This is a um, book by Ricardo Semler, which is called Maverick, and he also wrote The Seven Day Weekend, and it's about the company in Brazil that uh, his, he, he took it over as a very young age, and his, he first ran it sort of like a digital company, almost killed himself, and then he said, something's wrong here. And he got a brilliant uh, personnel manager, and he said, what I really want is cathedral builders. So he took this parable, and he said, I want cathedral builders. What does it take to have cathedral builders? And he kind of changed the whole philosophy of the company around, I got to figure out what it takes to have every single person in my company be a cathedral builder. So there's a lot in these books, they're pretty radical actually, about how he has a very large engineering organization with pretty much no rules, and, uh, and it works. But um, He's trying to create an environment where what uh, Ishikawa says, everybody reaches their full potential. They build cathedrals. So what you're trying to do, this is what I remember from my experience in the plant and from other times that I was working in. I had this beaten into my head. The idea is to move responsibility and decision making to the lowest possible level. That's what you do when you're a leader. You don't make the decisions. You do the same thing that they figured out in the art of war in you know, the 1870s and 1930s. Move this. It's the individual who counts. And it's the leader who makes that individual feel valuable and take initiative. That's the good leader. So if you have people, how do you know whether you have stone cutters or cathedral builders? So I have a test. And you can all take this test. <laughs> So say somebody shows up at your company 
in the morning and they get annoyed by their job. Something in their job makes them annoyed. I mean, it could happen to you, right? Ever been annoyed by something? Okay. So let's just pretend that happens. Now, the question is, what would you expect them to do? Would they complain? Would they ignore it? Or would they fix it? If you pretty much expect everybody to complain and you have cathedral stone cutters, and if they ignore it, you have people who are earning a living. And if you basically have the stuff in place that people are expected to fix the stuff that annoys them, then you have cathedral builders. So this concept of relentless improvement means the structures are in place, the management encouragement is in place, the leadership is in place, so that when people are annoyed by something in their job, their boss's job is to help them fix it, not live with it, not, well, sorry, that's regulations, but okay, how about we figure out what the real problem is? You know, maybe that's not the problem. Let's get at the root cause. How about you come up with an idea about what make it, it might make it better? Maybe we could do some experiments to figure out whether or not that really makes it better. That's the job of a manager in an organization that has cathedral builders and really can do constant improvement all the time for decades on end. So if you have cathedral builders, you have a leadership culture which helps people who are annoyed by their job use their creativity not to drop a suggestion in the suggestion box, but to go out and figure out how to solve the problem, get data, try experiments, prove that there's a better way, and make that better way the way things are done. So with that, um, it's time to go, I guess. And thanks, everybody.